Um, the, quest, the first question reads thus. If I am courting a guy and it's going okay, but I notice that I'm the giver of my time, resources, and he doesn't really reciprocate and tells me it's his boundaries. And it's usually too It is what? His boundaries. I think that from the way you even asked that question, it's clear what the answer is. First of all, you said you're courting him. He's not courting you, obviously. So if a guy is too busy for you, he obviously is not that invested in you. That one I know. Because if a guy, something is important to a guy or someone, he will make the time. Obviously, this isn't important. And if you're asking if it's signs to come, I think it is. I think it is. Thank you. The second question uh, reads this. As a young lady, how do I feel about somebody and feel like God has shown me my husband? I know confirmation is important and nothing has been confirmed. I'm also conscious that my emotions a marriage. However, I cannot shake that knowing. She has a dream, she has, right? a, she has had a dream about somebody. Someone, yeah. She yeah, believes that God is saying this is my husband, but she doesn't have confirmation. Yeah, then I don't know what she wants. What's the question, really? <laughs> the question if is... If you don't have confirmation, yeah. nobody has proposed to you. It's just a dream. Then you wait for the manifestation of the dream. I don't see that there's anything you can do, except you want to go against the natural order of mm. God, and you want to go and force the man to marry you. Mm. And that would still be a problem. But God is not a gossip. So if God tells you and it's really true, then he probably will tell him to. So wait it out. The truth is most women want to, most women need to learn patience. Sometimes we even pray and want to answer the prayer. The dream can come from anything. It can come from a multitude of business. That's what the Bible says. It can come from meditating too much. It can come from anything, really. So I would not, I would typically not base my married decision on one dream. You know, I don't think it's enough. Even if you have to be friends, this person may not even know you exist. You, don't even, you didn't even tell us that much. Does he even know you exist? And so you can't start a relationship with someone in your head. You've bought the wedding gown, you're signing the signature with your son name. And, oh. yes. So don't, don't, don't even wait. Continue. Just continue your life. Yeah. Okay. If, um, if he's the one, he will intercept you or interrupt you. But it, it, I'm saying this because I've seen a lot of ladies wait out something that was just their dream, yeah. something that was just their own desire for a guy. And now, 10 years after the guy is now married to somebody else, and they're now heartbroken, you know, by themselves, you know. So don't, don't even stop your life. Keep your options. And after as a woman, your mind can play tricks on you by the way it's designed. Your mind is restless. It's not used to being calm. And that's why the Holy Spirit at the Word of God helps you. If you don't do that, then your mind will keep running up and down. Give energy out. I didn't have time to go into that today. Part of charm we're talking about is all internal. What's going on inside you? If you're in love with somebody inside you, when other people come around you, they will see that there's no vacancy. Full-blown relationship with someone that you don't even talk to. Full-blown, you're even you're dressing alike. You are doing stuff, naming your kids. The person has not said anything. So emotionally, you're not available. When guys come around you, they can't tell. Your emotions are showing engaged. So... So you, you must free your mind from that. As a woman, the more flexible you are, the better. So I even tell women, when you are even creating a list of what you want in a guy, please don't let it be a tight. The moment you look at one particular, yes, I'm telling you now, because you, many, many, many women have missed. See, and as a woman, you know, hope you know you are, your own destiny is time sensitive. So you can't play with Men have a wider, longer range. A man can be 50 and very eligible. Hope you know this. If he's very rich and successful at 50, he can marry a girl at 20. You, I hope you know, you know this, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, so you, are, you, are, you, are, you are idolizing one particular guy, and he must be this height, this stature, and guys that are shorter are coming to you. You say, I don't have feelings for him. Of course you won't have feelings for him, because all your feelings are somewhere else already. Your feelings are not controlling you. They are not independent. Because many women think, oh, I just don't have... No, your feelings are not independent. Your feelings are following your thoughts. So if your thoughts are somewhere, of course that's where your affections will be. So you need to bring your affections back to even have it for somebody. 
You have already spent it for one fictional guy that is not in a basket with the touch of Bonner Boy. <laughs> that's what you're looking for. And, and, and then you, 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 it never happens. So bring your, as you're idolizing or fantasizing about marriage, please let it be just features, not a particular stature or structure. Or else, when a guy doesn't fit that picture, comes, just I don't have feelings for him. Your feelings are, you know, you can, you'll be amazed how, who you have feelings for when you give them a fair chance. Yes. Thank you. I will summarize this one because it's very long. Um, the person says, I'm asking on behalf of a friend. Mm -hmm. So the friend... We know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so ahead. the friend is in a relationship, and they have been in a relationship for six years. Mm -hmm. The guy says that he's not ready to propose, yeah. and the lady says she's really praying for it to work out. She's mm -hmm. busy praying but the guy is not ready to propose. It's been six years. So again, ladies, I wish I can, you know, I wish there's a way to actually go into your minds and help you lay out those things. As a rule, ladies, please don't enter indefinite relationships. I don't know why women are so scared of talking. First of all, they're scared of being alone. Secondly, they are afraid of talking. At the point of negotiating, when a guy is saying, I have a book here, 37 questions wise women ask. Please, women, get it. When a guy said, I want to marry you, define it. What women do is that they enter a relationship and start praying. You're in a relationship, you are praying. That's the weirdest thing ever. What relationship are you in? When you're entering, define it. There are seven questions you ask. One of it is when. Don't enter a relationship and start praying. You're not a slave or you're not, you're not, you're not kidnapped. You entered. So define what you're saying. Oh, you want to date me? What am I, for, to what end? I, for seven years, I want to bet you're already giving marriage benefits to this guy. And that's the worst thing you can do for a guy. God, guys get very demotivated. I have a book again here titled Manual, The Way Men Think. A man's thinking is very different from a woman's own. So if you enter a relationship with a man and you start giving him marriage benefits, he's totally demotivated. He sees marriage as a stress. Because he gets all the benefits. Imagine if you register in a school to study medicine, and from the first day you do your matriculation, they give you a certificate. That is, you're a doctor now. That if you have chance, if you're free, attend lectures <laughs> once in a while, and please try and see if you anytime you are less busy, do some exams. <laughs> what are the chances that guy will stay up all night reading? He's demotivated, he has gotten the certificate. So that's what a lot of ladies do and start praying. You can't do magic. Prayer is not magic. You're, you're, you're breaking major principles. From day one, when a guy says, I love you, I like you, say, what do you want? What, what, what do you mean? I just want us to see how we can be close, intimate friends that are tight and very friendly. And <laughs> don't let them tell you that kind of rubbish. Say, what exactly do you want? Let, I tell ladies, don't be available for dating. Be available for marriage. Ladies, are you listening? Don't be available for dating. Be available for marriage. The whole concept of a relationship is the middle process between when we talk, when we started talking and when we marry. So it's not as, as if it's a destination by itself. So when somebody dates you, in death, if, if a guy comes and says, I want to date you, and he dates you for seven years, and says, thank you very much. It was nice dating you. Now you are outdated. <laughs> Has he told any lie? you or not? So why, why are you crying? He, all he promised was dating, and you agreed. Seven years of dating, he has fulfilled promise. Have I not dated you? Is that not what I said at the beginning? So don't, 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 don't agree to such terms. I want to date you. What does that mean? Are we getting married? If we're getting married, then what, around when? Often. You're not a, a, a kidnapped victim. You're not, you're not a reject. You are precious. You have value. Is somebody getting what I'm saying? So that lady has negotiated wrong. Go back and read. If you're not ready for marriage, let's break up. Because you're attached to that place. Other people that could have seen you, they, they, know, they know you with the guy. So you're not available. But at the same time, you're not uh, engaged at the same time. Situationship. So come out of it. Let's, know, let's people know you're available. Change your status. Amen. And all that. Let people know you're... Thank you. Yeah. I'm not going to move to a question. Who ticks all the boxes but is addicted to pornography and prostitution? Yeah. 
And I'm also very careful of, especially when it comes to marriage questions, of just answering them here, like blank. There's so many questions I have. That's what you should do. Um, I don't know about ticking all the boxes. Prostitution is infidelity. Infidelity is dangerous. Infidelity damages people. Um, pray, right? Prayer has its place. But then I think you need to work with a therapist who is, who is a specialist at helping with addictions. Because pornography, that's why we always say, don't start. It's very addictive and it's very destructive. I've seen the pictures of someone who, someone who is addicted to pornography. If you see their brain, the damage, it, if you just, maybe you can Google it. You'll see the damage it does to their brain. So it's not, it's not just a, you know, a desire to now want to stop. I want to stop. No. There's the part where you will do your part spiritually, where you will pray and all of that. But this person needs help. So they need to get to um, an addiction specialist that can help them out of it. Don't wish it away. Don't say, oh, we're just going to pray. Prayer is what will help you guys to navigate that season. But the person also needs professional help beyond spiritual help. They need mental help. Um, so don't don't play with it. But I don't know. You have to first of all also remove yourself from the delusion that oh he ticks all the boxes. Just prostitute. Prostit are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure she was just trying to minimize the drama. Yeah, but you need to escalate. It's not something you minimize. It's it's, it's usually go out of hand. To get out of hand from this point, and even you need some assistance yourself because this whole thing will drown you too eventually. Because I see that you are really trying to hold on to help this guy out of it, you must also detach yourself a bit. If not, you will drop into it. So you need help. You need help in the way you are seeing the whole scenario. Because I'm sure somewhere you'll be blaming yourself too. That is a, yes, the spouse of an addict needs um, therapy too. So um, get help for yourself, get help for him. I hope he's willing to get help. And it might be long. I know it might, it's not something that will stop overnight. Yeah, but as long as he's willing to work on it, um, then you guys should work on it together. Yeah, but you need help yourself too, because I, I hear um, already the strain in your own, yes, in your own voice. Yes. Thank you, pastors. Um, the next question says, who leads in the relationship in marriage, in terms of setting the atmosphere or tone of the day-to-day -day activities? Um, when the Bible says the man should be the head, it doesn't mean he's going to be knowledgeable about everything. That's not how it works. Um, Part of being the head is not superiority, it's responsibility. God is saying, look, it doesn't represent the country in sports. It doesn't say I'm King Charles, so I have to play rugby. No. All right. So part of what it means to be a leader is to let people that are good. For instance, my family, our family finances is run by her. If it's run by me, this family will be borrowing from China. <laughs> <laughs> it's run. It's run by her. She's better at managing money. So um, everybody should do what they're better at. So it's like somebody asking me who should cook in the house. In my own house, that's not a debate at all. If I cook, we'll both be in the hospital. <laughs> so it's not a, something you now say he must cook. You're wasting your time. All right? So she's way better cook. I'm better at eating, as you can see, <laughs> from my stature. So, so you know, those things are... So, but you see, when a family is run out of love then it will no longer be by roles or demands. If you're seeing a family saying 50-50, they are not yet operating love. Real marriage is 100-100. You're bringing all of you. I'm bringing all of me. And we are, you know, using the, we are synchronizing based on who is better at what. All right? So it's not about um, who handles what. So that question itself shows there's a deeper problem. You guys are still operating like uh, colleagues. You need to know that you are a team. You are one. All right? And love should be the prevailing you know, um, think, controlling the decisions. So, yeah. Amen. Thank you. Another one says, how can a husband be emotionally available and responsive, even though he did not grow up in an emotionally responsive atmosphere? Oh, he should learn it. Most men um, are not as emotionally developed as women, naturally speaking. Most men are not. That's why I even did a book like this, How to Make Love to a Woman Without Touching Her. This be a guy, whether I'm single or married, buy this book and read it. Like I said, that you are not emotionally, this is not an excuse. People just don't want to grow. Um, me, I also was not emotionally available. I'm a guy's guy, if you know what that means. 
I'm a man's man. But before I became born again, I used to smoke weed. I, I used to have a pistol from high school, secondary school. So I was a rugged guy. When I even became born again, I was still a motorcycle riding kind of guy, a football guy. I come, I come to Manchester to watch matches. My club is Manchester City. Come to Etihad to watch football. So I'm a committed guy's guy. I play snooker, I ride fast cars. I'm a guy's guy. So when I got married, I didn't know all the mushy stuff women liked. I had to learn. My wife had to teach me that, oh, if I meet my wife on Monday, for instance, when we're dating, and our next appointment is next Monday, I don't call her throughout the week. Say next Monday. Because men talk for information, women talk for affection. Men talk because they have something important to say. Women talk because they have somebody important to say to. So if you don't understand that, men don't see any need to just be calling for calling sake. So if we see on Monday and appointment is next Monday, I don't call her. She now said, no, you have to call me through the week. I said, okay, no problem. You see, responsiveness, willingness. Yes, they say, I call it appointments. <laughs> but you see, that's how men think. We are not emotional. We are very practical and factual. So I had to call her. I'll call her in between and say, uh -huh, uh, I just say, I hail you. She said, you can't hail me. I'm not one of your guys. <laughs> so I had to learn that, oh, when you talk to women, you must be affectionate. You must be tender. You, she, she's not your guy. Do you get what I'm saying? But that's how guys talk. Guys don't do honestly. We just go to the point. So I had to learn. So number one, he must be willing to learn. Number two, then do the learning. Get books like this. Learn that oh, women view life differently. Some, what women consider talking is not what men consider talking. For women, we must talk about us. Talk about feelings. Talk, men hate talking about feelings. Men can talk about weather. Can talk about football. Talk about, talk about politics. But they, they find it difficult talking about themselves, about how they feel. You now learn how to express emotion, how to tell your wife she's beautiful, whether you feel like it or not. You must know that it's, it's a need for her, how to have those kind of conversations. So it's something you learn. Most times, guys don't come that way. Women generally, number one, are emotional by nature. Okay, that's number one. Even though some people like to act, you are better off being emotional. We just two sports. It's emotional. One is for sports, football. The other one is for money. So he needs to learn. That's what it means. He needs to learn how to be emotionally available. All right? So he should learn, basically. That's what I'm saying. Hallelujah. Thank you. Um, I'll summarize this one. It says that how can a married couple strengthen their prayer altar together so they invest in their own personal prayer altars and even prayer groups, but how do they strengthen their altar as a couple? I think the same way you strengthen your personal altar, you know, you pray by praying. So you guys have to now create time to pray together. So it's, it's simple. Sometimes we try to complicate things that are already simple. If you pray together, you will want to pray together. It just, it's, it's just a natural thing. The more you pray together, the more you find it easier to pray together. Now, it may not happen naturally. So for instance, Pastor Ki and I, uh, weirdly enough, we have to plan prayer times together. It doesn't happen because I'm, I'm an early riser. He goes to bed very late too. So usually the time we meet very early hours of the morning, I'm getting up. So I'm going to the bathroom to use myself because I've woken up. He's coming out of the bathroom because he's easing himself to go to bed. So 4.30 is when I wake up. That's usually when he goes to bed. So we don't really have. So it's not like we wake up in the morning, then we have morning, early morning devotion. No, it's like an owl and a chicken getting married. We just don't have that. So we have to find time together. Sometimes I don't even plan it. We just have those rare moments where we're cuddled up in bed. My head is on his chest. I was just saying in Jesus' name. Because if I tell him, let's pray, then you say, oh, let's find the time. Mm, let's just do it now. Now, <laughs> you know, so... I just start raising the prayer points and then I start praying in tongues and then he just, he just starts praying. So you have to be intentional about creating that time and praying together and then praying for each other. Um, we have a book we did together. They say, yeah, praying for your wife and praying for your husband. So you guys can do it together as a challenge. It's a 30 day thing. It will help because we find that people struggle with that as well. So it will help build your own spiritual intimacy. If you do, so every day, both of you decide to pray together using one prayer point. So you pray for your husband with him, with the prayer point, and she, he prays for you as well using that prayer point. So that's what you guys do for that day. So if you have, like, do it like a challenge, a 30-day challenge. Um, after 30 days, usually there will be a flow. All right. So two more questions, so that's, because we're still going two back to London. Like, okay. Yes. Um, there's one that says, so this one is before marriage, actually. 
It says, should I have sex with a man after he has paid my bride price? Or do I have to wait for the court and church wedding to take place? Okay. Um, again, I, I think you are focused on the wrong thing. What I would be worried about is why are we spacing out all the events? Why are you not getting married? Why are you doing it in little two um, batches? You know, um, technically, um, traditionally speaking, you are married. Do you understand? Marriage, um, there are three or more ways today that people can get married. You can do court, you can do church, you can do traditionally. They are all marriage. Some people do only one. It's just that Africans generally like to do the six or seven of them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we love all these ceremonies a lot. But any one of them would suffice, you know, suffice as marriage. So uh, technically you are married. Now, however, for some believers, which should be most believers, you, you would like to the altar, come to church. Because we are church people, all right? It's not necessary that the Bible says you must come to church. But because we are, ch this is this, this, uh, this our culture. Church is our culture. Okay? Because some people think, oh, church is a white man's. I don't, I don't get it. Church started from Middle East, from Christ. So how we are making it, you know, this is just people that are not interested in Christ. They're just making propaganda. Man or black man. Because Jesus was neither white nor black. Yeah, right? So all these things are just vain arguments. So church wedding cannot be the tradition of a white no, uh, church. How is, if church is wedding is tradition of white, that means church itself is tradition of white people. It's not. It started from Christ. It's Christianity. It's different from... So um, basically, because we are Christians, church is our culture. Weekly worship is our culture. Do, we dedicate children. Not because they won't be children if we don't dedicate them, but we understand spiritual things. So we, 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 we come officially before the Lord. So that's just how it is. Okay, so I would like you to wait till you. And the truth is that you have all your life to have sex. It's just devil pressuring you. This sex, when you still get married, you don't have to be dodging your spouse. You'll be too tired. You, there are people that three months they've not had sex. They are, so they are even too tired. When you, when you have worked all day, your bed is sexier to you <laughs> than any other human being. <laughs> you want to sleep. So all this, it's just, it's just Satan trying to deceive you. You know, to pressure you. Once you get married, you find that you, are, you also need motivation again to continue. So, so don't worry, yes. Amen. I'll take one more um, question. How do you deal with difficult in-laws and relationships and marriage? Can they be a deal breaker if they're really against the marriage? Uh, they're not. Yes, I come from a very nice family, yeah. even if I say so myself. <laughs> Him, on the other hand, <clears throat> I'm joking, I'm joking. No, not really, but... Um, Ah, in-laws. Ah. Which type? Mother-in-law or siblings-in-law? Because mother-in-law is a different category. But we're changing the narrative. We're changing the narrative. The new generation of Christians. Very good mothers-in-law. Uh, if our daughters-in-law behave. Um, so, <laughs> I'm joking. Um, hmm. In-laws can be a deal breaker. A lot of times. Um, but there's a God way, right? You can pray through it, but the most important thing is boundaries. You must have boundaries. So I always tell people, don't start what you can't finish. Okay? Don't, because you want to get married, ask your mother-in-law to literally move into your house. You do all those things. Then when you're not getting married, you think she's going to move her out. You can't do that. So you don't start what you can't finish. There must be boundaries. Second thing is, whoever has the parents must deal with the parents. So if his mom is giving me trouble, he needs to handle his mom. When she's not giving me trouble, she's my mom. I spoil and do everything. But you see, it's easier for you to handle your own parent. If your mom is annoying, you know you can tell her off. And she'll just say, you, you're being reasonable. But if you tell your mother-in-law off, it's a whole different matter. So if her son tells her off, you know, I says, back off, don't disturb my wife. She'll say, I don't like it. It's me you're talking to. Remember, I breastfed you. Like, mommy, mommy, leave it. And everything will be okay. If you try it and tell your mother in love, just back off. Ah, I don't know whether you'll see your back again. Or <laughs> you just... So, um, to avoid the drama, I would say the owner of the parents should handle the parents. Um, if it's siblings, 
of course, you guys should have boundaries. Um, make it clear to your siblings. You will not take any disrespect to your spouse. Um, also, be careful of running to your family and exposing your partner. So when there's an issue, if you run to them and you make your partner look bad, when you guys have resolved things, they usually don't forget. They'll bring it up or try to make a mess of things. So number one, prayer, wisdom from the word. Number two, boundaries. Um, I have a book. I didn't bring it. Um, the latest book I have called One Man, Six Books in One. One of the books is on uh, mentoring. And God taught me about how to manage my relationship with my mother-in-law through Ruth and Naomi. And so that's what Pascal was talking about earlier. I wish I brought I didn't, I didn't bring it. Um, it, it, it would, if you read the book of Ruth, it would change your perspective. You really read it properly. You know, you will see that Ruth and Naomi, Naomi couldn't have been the easiest person to be with. She was mourning her two sons and her husband. And Ruth was a constant reminder. And they were going on that long journey. In fact, when she got home, one of the things, Naomi means um, graceful, you know, and pleasant. One of the things was when she got home and they said, oh, our Naomi is back. Everybody loved her. They came out to welcome her. She said, don't call me that. Call me bitter because life has dealt with me. So she must have been bitter all the way. I, I can imagine how every time Ruth maybe. She's a reminder of my pain. And nobody likes the reminder of their pain. So she must have gone through a lot, but she stuck through it. She said, your God will be my God. Please. There must be boundaries. If not, you won't survive it. Your marriage won't survive it. And in, in closing, um, if it's a relationship and not a marriage already, like for instance, when my mother first met my wife, um, my mom was kind of hard on her and all that. Yeah, a lot of that day. I stood up to my mom and said, you, you will not do that. If you have any issue with her, talk to me. You cannot, you know, yeah. So I made it very clear, you know, that you can't talk to her like that. They are going to roast you. They are going to roast you. So <laughs> that's what matters. Praise God. Amen. Thank Let me, you. Great church, have you been blessed? Thank you. Thank you.